Well, thank you, Blackford, and I'm, I'm uh, honored to uh, be able to present to uh, um, such an accomplished uh, group. And uh, good, I got the, r the right first slide. Uh, the uh, keynote, the mandate given keynote speakers is something uh, that all of you uh, are at risk of. I read your bios and it reminded me that uh, there are some tips that one can adopt uh, and I've learned over the years. And so if you, you haven't, how many have already given a keynote at some point in their career? That's almost everybody. I'll predict that the rest of you will be asked to give uh, keynotes based on your credentials in the bios. So I'm going to interleave a set of um, kind of tips for giving a keynote talk, and hopefully I'll uh, be able to, to uh, show evidence that I've listened to the advice I've been given by my elders. So the first one is, is to know your audience. And clearly, I am preaching, if not to the converted, probably to the choir, since many of you are out um, advocating for systems approaches to decision support. But I also got very direct uh, uh, instruction from Mark Williams uh, a few days ago, which is short is better. <laughs> so I'm going to try and keep my keynote short. But those who know me know that I don't necessarily practice what I preach. <laughs> <laughs> the topics I like to cover are really only uh, th in three different buckets. The nature of genomic data and how it gave rise to the desiderata uh, of the two papers that were just discussed and uh, about which the survey was done some lessons from other industries about managing complexity. You might think from the title of this talk that it was going to be about patient safety. It is not about patient safety. It is about managing complexity. And it turns out that reliable systems in highly complex environments do happen to be safe. <laughs> uh, but that's not the central uh, uh, focus of, uh, the, of our interest in them for this um, session. And then Mark particularly asked me to uh, opine about the ideal state of uh, genomic clinical decision support, so that's how we'll end up. So the uh, the desiderata, as uh, as they were developed in the 2011 conference sponsored by NHLBI, uh, really derived directly from the nature of the data. Um, the first of, uh, uh, and this isn't just uh, genomics data; it's um, it's essentially all omics uh, data, all these high throughput molecular. Uh, methodologies that are uh, have given us the capability to simultaneously measure billions of um, molecular observations, and so it it begins just by being large, not large in terms of bits, but large and it gets its BD2K, its big data to knowledge um, uh, qualifications, uh, primarily by virtue of its heterogeneity, so or its variety as well as its volume. So we've got billions of base pairs, we've got hundreds of thousands of proteins, tens of thousands of genes, thousands of different expression levels. But amidst all of that volume, it's clear that details really matter. And so the anchoring case for <clears throat> Mendelian and genetics in the 20th century in terms of clinical relevance was the discovery of the beta-6 valine substitution in the human uh, uh, hemoglobin B gene, which gives rise, so a single change in the letter of the alphabet gives rise to sickle cell disease. And we are in an era now where we have no perfect and preferred laboratory method. So all generate useful data, none of them generate perfect data, all of the data has blind spots and noise and errors in it. Um, only a small fraction of the total observable data is conclusively associated with health status at present, although our expectation is that that will change over time. Importantly, molecular control mechanisms are, are essentially, uh, um, if not absent, so poorly understood that we uh, can't connect or predict on the basis of control mechanisms whether something will have a disease uh, importance. And then, uh, the as a result of that, interpretation of variation is changing rapidly. So that gave rise, that character, the fundamental characteristics of the data itself gave rise to the first of the Desiderata papers. And just to remind you, you've already heard it, the idea of the lossless data compression was not from the image data of the high throughput modalities, which is noisy. And as you may know, um, in our next-gen sequencing world of, you know, 300, 500-fold reads, uh, 
Essentially, that's using a civil jury model to get a preponderance of evidence, evidence about the identity of any nucleotide at any particular position. It's probably not necessary to keep that um, noisy source data, but to the extent that it gives rise to a consensus agreement about what the identity of a nucleotide is, uh, at whatever level of confidence that method generates, um, then if that's taken as the source data, the, the uh, genomic sequence, then being able to compress that in a way that um, allows one to sort of dehydrate it and rehydrate it uh, as it moves in and out of a clinical environment um, seem to be important. The, the uh, uh, second one was this notion that since none of the methods are perfect and they will change, we need to carry annotation of what the method used was so that we could compute, if you will, the expected variation from um, the uh, ideal state. And uh, we have laboratory um, uh, data standards such as LOINC that are built on that model of the result carrying with it the method by which it was generated. This thing's not working all that well. So compact representation, uh, representation of clinically actionable subsets came directly from um, Clem McDonald, who coined the notion of clinician think speed. And that is that uh, it takes, his observation was it takes a clinician about a quarter of a second to get the next idea when they see something on the screen. And so any system that's at least that fast can stay ahead of the, of the clinician's need for additional information. Uh, a, a, a big uh, emphasis on the idea that you could have concurrent um, and, uh, and probably linked versions of the same knowledge, both that readable by human beings and that that could be used by decision support rules. The idea of separating the primary sequence data, which presumably, if it is true, remains accurate uh, and useful throughout one's uh, lifetime, if not uh, the lifetime as well of your descendants, uh, from the clinical interpretations that we expect uh, to uh, change as uh, science changes. Also, just expect to be um, upset entirely. Uh, the, the notion of uh, a single, uh, a lot of the dialogue about EMRs was, oh, okay, so it's three times 10 to the ninth base pairs. We can do that. It's not much larger than an x-ray. But, but it really is not a single, uh, ger even germline copy if things such as telomeric shortening and genomic re rearrangements that are part of normal a aging uh, are complemented by the somatic variation of cancer. So at least we need the size, the EMR capacity for multiple copies of the genome, and maybe it's, you know, a genome per metastasis, if you will, in a cancer setting. Uh, uh, but also that uh, the lesson from HIV of, of the molecular machinery being run backwards, <laughs> uh, so to speak, uh, by um, uh, retroviruses, uh, that there, we probably have more surprises in store about the dynamic nature of our uh, uh, genome and our derivative products uh, such as the proteome and other omics. And then lastly, this notion that was anchored primarily in the observation of the growing importance of rare variants, and that is that each one of us really is, in a sense, uh, uh, a snowflake, uh, a, a unique uh, research resource, because there is really no one exactly like us who has our combination of rare variants, but the simple statistical requirement of being able to find people who are sufficiently similar to us to, to get association statistics to develop predictive models and do that in a setting where it's not minor allele frequencies of 1 to 5 percent, but it's 10 to the minus fourth or lower. Now you need very, very large uh, pools of individuals from which you draw these virtual cohorts for comparison. And so that kind of raises the bar on the societal importance of being able to uh, support individual care and discovery science that potentially every single person's genome has secrets that can help improve um, uh, care and understanding of disease and health. Uh, among the topics that have been front and centered, as echoed by Blackford's uh, uh, recitation of the results of the survey, is this uh, opportunity to have an, an under, and challenge of creating both human viewable and uh, formats and links to interpretation. So the sincerest form of flattery I found if you publish a paper 
is that somebody not only continues the title of technical desiderata, but when they create them, they actually begin numbering them above the number of, of the first ones that you created. So I'm, I'm greatly honored uh, by Dr. Kawamoto and, and, uh, and, and uh, Welsh et al. in their uh, extending for purposes of clinical decision support the original desiderata and not sort of uh, rejecting any of them. Um, and their observations, I'll go through them quickly because we have the authors in the, in the room, um, is that is, this is the expected interaction of gene genes and of uh, the ability to reason with both the clinical data combined with the genotypes uh, means that we've got to be able to do this at scale with multiple genes, uh, particularly for complex traits where there's um, uh, only a partial explanation of the variance by any single trait. Um, keeping the CDS knowledge separate from the variant classification um, keeps the two of them in, in a state where they can be separately uh, updated. Uh, the uh, problem of interoperability uh, in the world of ONC and of operational genomics. Um, the large number of gene variants in the paper was uh, epitomized by um, the uh, hereditary colon cancer story where there are up to 1,200 variants in, in the same set of genes that essentially have equivalent physiologic uh, consequences so that we have to be able to not think of it as one gene variant per rule, so to speak, but be able to, to gather them together uh, and keep the CDS knowledge um, general and simple as possible, uh, leverage both the standards in clinical decision support and genomics to get forward progress in operationalization of these things, um, an important supporting of a knowledge base deployed and developed by multiple independent, because nobody sees enough of the cases to be able to do it inside their own organization. Um, this one was a little, uh, this I think uh, anchored the lower end of the agreement, and, and I think it speaks to the issue of um, whether you should err on the side of providing more information to people and, and not knowing exactly what they're going to use it for, or don't expose them to anything that isn't actionable. Uh, and, and there, uh, the, the specter of, if you will, a genetic exceptionalism and or paternalism of, I, I know what's important, therefore I will not let you see everything else, uh, kind of raises itself, uh, and you saw that in the response uh, on the survey. So. That, all of that together, I um, have, have shown this over, over the years. This is just a cartoon um, of uh, basically molecular data uh, driving the escalating complexity in healthcare. It has no reality to it other than the line that's been well known since the 1970s of the upper bounds of human cognition. Uh, I'm a hematologist, uh, oncologist. and. We were kind of molecular geeks early on, and we often got overwhelmed with too many markers, too many RFLPs, too many molecular things that might bear on our diagnosis or therapy. And so we were some of the first uh, clinicians to do what human beings reliably do when you get uh, more data than you can deal with, and that we just, we simply extinguished variables <laughs> until we could get it into a space we were comfortable with. But as we have uh, 25,000 structural genes giving rise to each of them potentially one of several thousand expression levels, and those giving rise um, to 400,000 or so uh, proteins, um, we're clearly in a space that's above, you know, five to seven things that we can remember as covariates. So that's the most important aspect of this growth of molecular data, is it puts us in a decision-making space that exceeds the bounds of unaided human cognition for cl clinicians. So the next talk about giving keynotes is you really ought to talk about stuff you know, and if, if, particularly if you have um, a personal experience, it, it will add credibility. So in that context, um, one of the uh, things that's relevant for what follows is that uh, I got my pilot's license a few years before I started a medical school and is and still active uh, in, a, in have had an experience in a range of, of aviation environments that include the little four-seater on, on the left that's my, my current kind of uh, chariot for cross-country travel up to and including the Boeing 737-800, remarkably uh, complex um, uh, uh, machine, and 
all of the workflow and training issues that surround um, aviation is something that I have wondered and watched over four decades now of uh, watching one industry reinvent itself in very dramatically new uh, and effective ways and watching another industry, which was my primary job, keep not changing for reasons that came, became, have become inc increasingly um, uh, sort of illogical to me. So that's one set of context uh, for what follows. The other is um, I, I've, I, I'm not a nuclear power plant operator, and, and to um, obviate any Homer Simpson jokes, I don't play one on TV. However, there was uh, a very interesting and intense uh, two-day workshop held in San Diego in July of 2012 uh, that brought together representatives from nuclear power uh, industry and healthcare, and I uh, co-authored one of the, the chapters on how uh, diagnosis of pro problem solving is done in those two areas for this monograph that resulted. And so that give, uh, gave me the uh, opportunity and the idea for this talk of um, comparing and contrasting how um, these three industries deal with complexity. Uh, they are very similar in a number of ways. They, uh, they all serve uh, an important public good. They all depend highly upon highly trained uh, and skilled, educated professionals. They work with high hazard socio-technical systems, so they're capable of causing great harm when things go wrong. They're all highly regulated by a, a variety of external um, watchdogs and oversights. But at that point, they begin to di diverge. The nature of the industries um, of uh, healthcare compared to both aviation and nuclear power is that the standardization of practices and methods is very highly uh, developed in um, the other two industries. And healthcare is more or less prides itself on the notion of a thousand doctors, a thousand opinions. Uh, the rapid industry-wide adoption of best practices uh, is also a prominent feature of the other two industries, but um, is notably absent in healthcare. We often cite uh, that sort of landmark study that showed 17 years to 50% adoption of uh, best evidence in healthcare. It's probably about time to redo the, the, that study. And then, um, importantly, uh, reliance on individual professionals uh, acting autonomously. And so I'd like uh, to highlight uh, for the next part of this talk these two things, because the other two industries over the last 40 years changed in a very large way with respect to these two features, whereas healthcare didn't change very much uh, in its um, uh, approach to those uh, features of decision making. And so particularly nuclear power um, was not uh, uh, noted by its rapid adoption of new uh, approaches and its group-wide uh, problem-solving, and it now is. And e aviation was built on a model of uh, a marine uh, model like uh, ships, of the, the captain of the ship model, very rigidly hierarchical command and control structures. And it was kind of four plus in, in the, that, and uh, now there's uh, almost, there's very far, far less reliance on autonomous individuals, and we'll go through that. So that um, brings me to keynote tip number four, which is <clears throat> by and large, and we'll test this hypothesis now, people like stories as long as they are brief and relevant. So let me tell you a couple stories. The first one's in uh, aviation, uh, and it's the story of Captain Jakob von Zanten. Um, so Captain Van Zanten was a uh, very, very famous aviator. If he had been a cardiac surgeon, he would have been the Michael DeBakey of cardiac surgeons. Um, he uh, uh, grew up, uh, he was born in 1927, he grew up, uh, got his pilot's license in the late uh, 40s when he was uh, only 20 years old. He um, became a commercial pilot rapidly ascended uh, to international prominence as the chief safety officer of KLM um, Royal Dutch uh, Airlines. He was also sort of a handsome, charismatic guy in, in person. Not only did he write training curriculum and, and uh, ran a, a tight ship as a highly disciplined and accomplished uh, professional, um, but uh, he got himself in the uh, advertising. So this was the uh, 
of uh, an advertising campaign of, of uh, KLM, and there's Captain Van Zanten in the picture there, smiling. So Captain Van Zanten was overtaken by a rare variant scenario. His uh, 747 uh, headed for Las Palmas uh, on March 27, 1977, was uh, diverted by an unlikely series of events. There was a terrorist uh, bomb threat at Las Palmas, so they di uh, diverted all the traffic to um, another island, a little airport called Tenerife. Uh, and uh, so suddenly a small airport with not much capacity was, uh, was crowded with large airliners, Boeing 747s, multiple of them. They arrived in the middle of the afternoon. Uh, there was good weather, but not enough uh, capacity. So, um, so Captain Van Zanten offloaded all of his passengers in the terminal, had to go someplace else to refuel his airplane. Another airplane was brought into the terminal. When uh, it was time to leave, they ha were unable to shuffle all of the airplanes correctly because everybody was in everybody's way. He had to go back and pick up his 245 passengers. Time was going because he was working in the context of a Dutch law that says it was like uh, duty hours for residents. If a pilot was on duty for more than a certain number of hours, they could be criminally pro prosecuted in, in the Netherlands for, st for staying on duty too long. So there was a certain urgency. And during the middle of the afternoon, the fog moved in, and suddenly the airport was, nobody could see any of the airplanes, uh, the airplanes that are out there. And they, because the uh, taxiways were crowded, they had to have airplanes back taxiing, that is, going back down the runway in order to get a turn off to go where they were supposed to go. With all of that occurring, Hours of delay, the clock running, thick fog, nobody could see anything. Uh, Doctor, I'm uh, sorry, uh, Captain Van Zanten, I guess that's a uh, Freudian slip, uh, uh, exercised his pilot and command authority uh, to move the throttles forward uh, and uh, take off in the absence of a takeoff clearance. Uh, a most basic fundamental mistake that can be made in aviation, and as we know, there was another 747 pointed the other way coming down the runway, and the two of them collided. Um, Captain Van Zanten um, lost his life and killed 582 other people that, in that hour, uh, and making it the worst aviation disaster in history. So the aviation community took an important message to heart about all of this, and that is you had the most perfect pilot, the pilot that everyone wanted to be, the chief safety officer of the airline, causing the worst aviation disaster in history. So aviation changed at that point over the course of the ensuing decade. This model of reliance on autonomous, individual, highly skilled professionals and their ability to cause very dire consequences. Second story, uh, and for those of you who like the rest of the story, there's a very uh, interesting uh, book written by John Nance, who is uh, uh, the ABC aviation guy, and I think this was actually co-written by Lucian Leap because it has such amazingly uh, pithy insights into the nature of healthcare, of, of not only that incident, but why the workflow issues and the hierarchical decision-making of healthcare uh, are going to prevent it from ever achieving uh, the kind of reliability that uh, is seen in aviation. So the second story is that uh, also of, of a bad outcome. The, the Three Mile Island uh, nuclear plant um, underwent a partial meltdown as a result of a sequence of events of confusion, too much data, misinterpretation. There was a human computer interface issue. Uh, the plant operators uh, misread some of the sensor data and believed that they had um, too much pressure in their cooling water system, so instead of too little pressure, they vented it to the outside, so the radiation leaks occurred, the cooling system shut down, the reactors partially melt down. It is still the most uh, serious uh, incident, uh, nuclear reactor incident in American history even now. But the important thing about this uh, is not the details of that, but rather what that industry did as a result of that incident. There are about 40 companies that run the 100 or so nuclear power stations in America. They're competitors with one another. They're, they're regulated by the Nuclear Regulatory Agency and a number of other safety-related uh, agencies. And they, uh, up until this time, had uh, 
features like hospitals are behaving like commercial competitors. They changed the model. And in fact, the professional society of the nuclear power uh, generators has an important motto that came out at this San Diego conference. And that is, what happens to one of us happens to all of us. And as a result of that view of the importance of group decision making, they now have international networks for doing dynamic real-time problem solving when something goes off nominal in any nuclear power station. They communicate quickly with one another to use the world mind, the best accumulated experience of everyone to understand, if you will, these rare variant situations. So. Next tip about giving keynotes is that rather than complaining, it's better to light a candle than curse the darkness. So the candle that we're uh, focusing on is the promise of automated patient-specific clinical decision support. And here is an example of the uh, kinds of gains that can be achieved by what we would call routine, uh, currently extant clinical decision support. This came from uh, Vanderbilt, and it shows on the left-hand side uh, before their implementation of their provider order entry system with decision support, that healthcare is about a one sigma industry, that out of every 10 chances to make a mistake, uh, on average we make a mistake about three times out of 10, uh, and that if we try really, really hard, we might get one sigma, but we're nowhere near um, nuclear power where nine sigmas is the uh, standard, and if they fall to seven sigmas, they consider it a crisis in the industry. Uh, but the implementation of provider order entry uh, uh, reduced by two orders of magnitude the level of mistakes being made relative to prescribing, and that has uh, been sustained over, over time. And so that's our, um, our image of the kind of improvement we could get in the management of complexity, because human beings are just basically not that good at being large list processors of inter understanding drug-drug interactions and remembering all the possible um, uh, uh, component parts of complex systems. So for those who are not uh, aficionados, uh, those who may be viewing this on Genome TV after today's uh, session, as well as on the web, it's important to know that when um, computer folks uh, talk about rule-based systems, they're not meaning that providers must follow rules. Uh, it, it, uh, people get their back up about that, but really, in an informatics context, rules are focused in the recognition logic, that is, the ability to detect that some uh, set of real-world things uh, or features of a problem uh, exist, and therefore, uh, it's time to do something. And the interventions are not necessarily guidance that say, you must do this, but they can range from educational prompts prompts to gather more data to become more sure about what's happening, particularly with genotype, phenotype, uh, or those taken together. They can improve the certainty um, of diagnosis. They can do the more commonly uh, uh, associated view of clinical decision support, which is you give you a choice of what, of, uh, what the best evidence-based therapy might be. They could also simply provide uh, information relative to prevention or prognosis. So, in the spirit of, again, lighting a candle rather than cursing the darkness, um, the Vanderbilt PREDICT project is an, exa an early example of doing genomically enabled or pharmacogenetically enabled decision support. It had both a workflow that is a socio-technical model that included both a people component, which was creating a genomics subcommittee of pharmacy and therapeutics that reviewed uh, best available evidence and decided when there was sufficient evidence to go to clinical implementation, uh, where the, uh, int the key intervention was to do prospective genotyping um, of uh, using about a 200 marker panel of drugs relative to uh, drug metabolism, and do that on a population of patients uh, using an algorithm that identified those at elevated prior probability that at some point in the future they would be prescribed a drug for which pharmacogenetic data uh, was, uh, would be useful. And so that was a focusing lens using features from the EMR to find a population, then go ahead and do the genotyping ahead of time so that it already existed. So that at the time that a prescriber, any prescriber, whether they knew the literature or not about pharmacogenetics, would prescribe a drug for which that information was relevant, there could be an infrastructure of decision support that would 
uh, give them a notification of relevant data they might not otherwise uh, know or understand, and then close the loop, that is, follow the outcomes. D that is, uh, did providers actually change the dose? Did the patients um, do better or worse as a result of that? So this was the face of the decision support alert, a pop-up uh, for um, clopidogrel therapy in patients who had a uh, SIPS, uh, SIPS uh, two, two, uh, C19 star 2 variant, and it is an, uh, an example of a key computer technology that's part of this um, arena called the event monitor, where you have uh, a computer whose job it is to just sit and watch data appearing in the clinical environment, and then if certain conditions are satisfied to do something that uh, sends a message to a provider. So with, with that as uh, a, a kind of candle that uh, uh, provides uh, the existence proof that this can be done, and it can be done at scale. PREDICT is now genotyped over 14,000 patients, and the article in that uh, citation uh, summarizes the experience of doing that. Um, the ideal state that uh, I was asked um, by Blackford and Mark to uh, identify uh, reminds me of an, another keynote tip talk I got from my research mentor, uh, Sam Rappaport at UC San Diego, and he said, you know, it's better to be approximately right than precisely wrong. So I'm going to try and do that. This is not a bad feature for your entire career, by the way. <laughs> uh, and so I'm going to try and be approximately right and just uh, opine about things that I think would represent an ideal state of genomic clinical decision support. First, it would um, always be up to date, it, that making it thereby um, and, and trustworthy. It would have content that could be repurposed for different types of users, so you wouldn't have separate systems, but you'd have perhaps different uh, versions of the same knowledge for specialists, non-specialists, laypersons, and their families. It would be, in that context, sensitive to both health literacy and numeracy literacy, because a lot of this is st statistical probability kinds of information. It would explain all of its actions. Instead of just giving you um, a pop-up that tells you to do something, it would allow you to understand why you were given that recommendation. And, uh, and an important thing, I think, here, which very few clinical decision support systems have, uh, mirrors the experience, for example, of using Amazon, right? And that is it, that a system that adaptively knows what you don't know and what you know, even when you don't know <laughs> what you don't know. Uh, so it appears to get smarter. That is, it doesn't give you prompts that you actually have already shown that you don't need, but it recognizes the limits of your knowledge. And importantly, on the back end, it actually does get smarter, and we'll talk about ways it would get smarter at the national level. As seen by the healthcare organization rather than the users, uh, the ideal genomic uh, clinical decision support would be a in systems infrastructure that would um, measurably improve quality and consistency by these uh, autonomous individual practitioners. They're going to still be there along with interdisciplinary healthcare teams. It would track decision those support events and provides the basis for cor uh, subsequently correlating the clinical course. And importantly, it would do that whether or not the users accepted the guidance. I think that's a, a key feature. The first couple of generations of clinical decision support figured that their job was done once the message was delivered. But now we need to realize that the important, that's just an intermediate step. That's an intervention. And we need, in a systems approach, also track the downstream outcomes of having provided that guidance. And that at the national level, that would not only support a continuous local process improvement, but um, create this, uh, help create this thing called a learning healthcare system. The building blocks for it uh, include both uh, informatics kinds of things like knowledge representation standards, the electronic envelopes, if you will. And, and in my mind, it, you, the envelope has to contain at least three classes of information. The first is the recognition logic for the con conditions of interest as represented in the clinical systems, and this is both phenotype and genotype recognition logic. That sort of primes the rule to fire. Then, that something, then you do something. You provide some kind of guidance for some set of target users, the patients, families, clinicians. And then this recognition logic as, as well for close, closing the loop on the decision support. That has some downstream 
measure, some analog, if you will, of a hemoglobin A1C in diabetes, if you, ha if you would be so fortunate as having a process or outcome measure that shows you um, uh, whether something good or bad happened downstream, and you could correlate that with whether the, ex the guidance was accepted or rejected. Because historically, in clinical decision support, a lot of clinicians said, I'm smarter than your rules. I don't need your rules. And maybe they're right, right? So we ought to be able to learn and revise the rules based on the actual experience of what happened and whether or not they were followed. Then there's these other things that uh, people in the room who build these systems are very familiar with. It's the uh, uh, accessory uh, collateral uh, systems infrastructure, so you have decision support authoring systems that allow groups of clinicians to easily import, review, understand, and implement um, these decision support packages that they get from a public library-like function. You've got the event monitors, system-generated alerts, automated tracking of outcomes. And then let me focus on this, um, well, I guess the, the current, it's, it's uh, fashionable to call things a commons if you're pooling data from multiple sources. <laughs> so the uh, CDS information commons, um, I think, uh, would be at its best if it was built on the principle of the nuclear power plants. That is, what happens to one of us happens to all of us. And what a contrast that is in healthcare where we tend to use patient privacy as the justification for not sharing things and choosing not, not to learn about things in many cases. That would be managed by a neutral, trusted organization. And here there are multiple possibilities. And I hope over the course of this conference that you could uh, imagine that, uh, whether there's a natural home of places like the National Library of Medicine or a, cons a uh, 501c3 consortium or a Wikipedia-like organization. And the way you would close the loop nationally, at least in my mind, simply would be if you that you have a quid pro quo. If you get information from the library and you use it, the, uh, the, the contract for doing that is that you submit your aggregate, you know, uh, uh, de-identified upload of, of uh, that outcomes data back to the public library so that it learns uh, and, and the whole system gets smarter over time based on the aggregate experience of all the users of um, the decision support. So my last talk uh, tip comes from Albert Einstein and, Einstein and that, uh, Reminds me that it's time to end, and I thank you for your <laughs> attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions. <clears throat>